Sounds good. Okay, well, I'm pleased to be joined joined by Joe Sparts, um, president of St. Paul Building Owners and Managers Association, otherwise known as BOMA. And uh, Joe, thank you for joining us today. Um, I understand that you'll be stepping down, retiring, effective in June. So congrats on that. Um, well, yeah, thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for uh, having me on today. Yeah. So um, I guess just to just to start at the beginning, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, first of all, tell us a little bit about St. Paul BOMA for folks who might not be super familiar with uh, BOMA and your mission. Um, what can you tell us about BOMA and uh, your your how many members you have and kind of some of the different things you're involved in? Yeah, so I hope that people know who we are because, you know, we run all those Super Bowl commercials, you know, and so you think our brand would be out there. But in any event, uh, for those that missed those, um, yeah, we are uh, involved in commercial real estate. So Building Owners and Managers Association um, is really the, the key commercial real estate association uh, in the country. We're, we're connected into BOMA International. Uh, so we're an affiliate of them. There's about 93 BOMAs across the US, most major markets have at least one or two. There's St. Paul BOMA in the Twin Cities, there's Minneapolis BOMA. Um, so what we do is within St. Paul and the um, suburban communities around St. Paul is that we provide a variety of services that help uh, buildings, commercial buildings operate more efficiently and effectively, which is good for you know, their bottom line, it's good for their tenants, their, um, their employees, so, you know, that's, that's what we are all about. Okay. And so your members are obviously building owners and managers. Uh, who else might be interested in, in membership? Uh, do you have affiliates and so on? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, any, anybody who's tied into a commercial structure, uh, in some cases, you know, that's also going to be the building engineers and other individuals, brokers. Um, you know, they can be members of BOMA. They're, they are part of uh, BOMA. We also have a, a core group of, uh, we call them service partners, other call them allied members within BOMA. And these are or businesses and organizations that provide services to commercial buildings, be it, you know, roofing or parking lot maintenance or, you know, whatever the case it is, whatever it takes to be able to keep, you know, large or even smaller uh, commercial structures uh, operating effectively. Um, that's what they do. And so they're also a key part of the uh, BOMA membership. And how long have you been with St. Paul BOMA and what have your various job duties been? Yeah, so I started uh, with uh, St. Paul BOMA back in February of uh, 2013. So I just uh, uh, got by my uh, ninth anniversary here. And so, you know, I've uh, been the um, office, um, you know, person, the, the, the leader, uh, president of uh, BOMA during that period of time. So I work with, you know, members, I work with volunteers at BOMA because, you know, uh, associations in general, but especially the BOMAs really uh, uh, can operate without the incredible volunteers coming from our membership. And so, you know, those volunteers who are on committees and just actively participating in, in events and then the leadership uh, itself. So those folks who uh, are willing to, you know, chair those committees or be on the board of directors. So, you know, it's my job to, to work with all those groups and uh, keep the, the events and the activities and the, really the, the key uh, benefits that we drive out to our members, education and advocacy and professional networking we keep those programs and, and those services uh, thriving and, and meeting the needs of the members. And, and talk a little bit, if you will, about uh, your career journey and how you ended up with uh, St. Paul BOMA. What, uh, what were you, uh, have you been involved in building management in other capacities? Yeah, I actually uh, had uh, absolutely zero experience in commercial real estate or construction or real estate in general uh, prior to taking the job with BOMA. Really, most of my career had been in the human capital uh, field. 
uh, dealing with HR, uh, labor relations, leadership training, uh, just training in general. I had worked uh, for a good chunk of time out at a organization called uh, Employers Association and more recently TrueSight. And so uh, was running that. I had I'd been involved in human capital for you know, over uh, 25, maybe closer to 30 years. And you know, was looking for a, a, a new challenge, uh, a new adventure, if you might wanna say. And so uh, was contacted by um, St. Paul BOMA. Uh, they were in need of uh, finding a, a new president. And so Matt Anfang, the, the prior president had stepped down. And so um, I, I was very interested in, uh, in that new challenge, not only from the commercial real estate standpoint, but also, you know, I've always been an advocate of, if you really wanna know a city, you gotta either have to work there or live there. And while uh, I knew St. Paul as a visitor, you know, coming in to the X or to restaurants, whatever the case might be, I really didn't know St. Paul that well. I'd grown up and lived in Minneapolis, worked on either in downtown Minneapolis or out in the Minneapolis suburbs. So, that to me was another adventure, and I was very excited by being able to take that on. So it's it's worked out very well for me. In 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 2013, when you first started, what were some of the first priorities or some of the big issues you dealt with at that time? Yeah. So what we needed to do was to step back, as as any new leader in an organization um, will do, and and I'm going to advise you know my replacement uh, to do the same thing is you wanna step back and just kind of survey uh, the organization itself, you know, what's going well, you know, what, what can uh, be changed uh, to again, meet the member needs. Essentially, you kind of do that strategic planning process. So, you know, we went through that, we identified, you know, key elements that we were interested in, in uh, doing for the organization, again, that, that uh, took into account, you know, changing needs of the association itself and being able to, you know, jump in there and uh, provide both programming and uh, general services that meet the member needs. You know, one thing that we did early on that quite frankly was, was kind of risky, um, but uh, at the end of the day, it, it worked out fantastic, is in, if you remember back in 2014, um, climate change, you know, global warming was, was more the, the label back then, was, was more um, contentious than it is today in terms of a general public acceptance to it and certainly the business community. And so um, I, I worked with the education committee to suggest that uh, we should put a program on regarding that. And, and then we partnered with the Science Museum, but we didn't wanna just come out and call it climate change or, or, or global warming. And so really we, we looked at it from a standpoint of saying, okay, how will extreme weather events or an, incre an increase in extreme weather events affect commercial real estate? And so we brought in uh, Mark Seeley from the University of Minnesota, you know, the, the, the great famous uh, climatologist. And, and again, this wasn't about any politics whatsoever. This was about what are the facts? What is the science telling us about the increase in extreme weather events? And so, you know, if you're a building and you have a lot of your key systems infrastructure, heating, cooling in the basement, and you end up getting a six, seven, eight inch rainfall and the city's capacity to deal with that is maybe five inches in a certain period of time and maybe six or whatever. Uh, what's gonna happen where your basement's gonna flood, you know, your building's gonna be out of the commission for a while. So you, you need to be thinking about that going forward since the probability of extreme weather increases. So uh, we, we did that, uh, you know, some members came in it's skeptical, you know, well, what's going on here, Joe, this is a little different. Uh, and when they left, they were just so impressed uh, with the information that this is something that really opened their eyes. And so, you know, what we were willing to do early on is to try a few different things, come at um, information, programming from a different angle. You know, I'm a real, for those folks who know me, a real creative guy. And so I'm always trying to be open to new ideas, new directions, uh, you know, kind of turn everything just a couple of degrees uh, in a different direction, look at it from a different perspective. And in the long run, sometimes it ends up blowing up in your face, I'll admit that, but other times, and more, more than not, uh, it ends up being a, a really healthy way to kind of move things along and be able to, you know, kind of move the ball forward, so to speak. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's a great approach to talking about it. And just uh, sometimes it helps to avoid some of the labels and just uh, go with the facts and say, hey, here's here's what's happening and how are we going to deal with this? So right. um, talk about in the um, one of the things that was mentioned in the notice that came out about your retirement is this downtown security study that happened in 2018. Mm -hmm. What what can right. you say about that? And what was the uh, impetus for that? Right, yeah, okay. So um, in about 15, a group of uh, downtown leaders, uh, BOMA uh, took the leadership role on this, started meeting and, and we informally called our group the Downtown Alliance, St. Paul Downtown Alliance. And so it wasn't an official group, but you know we wanted to drive greater vitality in downtown St. Paul, we all had that interest. So, you know, it was uh, myself and Pat Skinner and Julie Bach from, from BOMA, but, you know, other leaders, you know, like uh, Matt Kramer uh, with the, the, the chamber and Lou Jamboy, uh, who is uh, with the Port Authority and a couple of other key leaders like Julio Fesser and Jim Stolpestad. So we, we were talking and meeting, coming up with different ideas. And uh, out of that, uh, year plus conversations and, and ideas and thoughts, a couple of uh, initiatives occurred. One was to say, okay, we can't just be this informal group. We need to formalize this downtown Alliance structure. And so, you know, Matt Kramer uh, ran with that and worked with the uh, Riverfront Corporation to get a process going to include key stakeholders. And eventually that all led to the um, current official downtown Alliance that exists today. But a separate track that we took was based upon feedback that was coming in from security professionals and concerns being expressed by tenants and, and residents is, you know, um, we're, we're a bit concerned about security levels. Um, we just want to feel uh, more comfortable. So has there ever been any kind of assessment, security assessment, risk assessment of downtown St. Paul? And of course, there, there hadn't been shouldn't say, of course, there hadn't been. And so we decided to go ahead and take that on. So we engaged uh, a, a group, um, um, Rosen Security, uh, Michael Rosen, who's really well known uh, worldwide for the work that his group does, and uh, you know brought them in to basically uh, do this assessment of downtown. So did a very thorough, deep dive analysis, uh, surveyed, uh, pulled together all kinds of data. And then all, out of that ultimately came up with a series of recommendations. And then that, that paralleled with what was going on with the uh, creation of the Downtown Alliance and ultimately the decision to create this Downtown Improvement District. And so the, the emphasis in terms of creating that Downtown Improvement District was promoting one of the key uh, recommendations that come out of the study, which was to create this essentially a fusion center. So the Safety Communication Center in downtown um, St. Paul. And so um, the two of those coming together helped then to get support for the downtown improvement district. And then they created this fusion center, this uh, safety communication center. And, and we have that in place today. So um, that was kind of the, the reason behind that, the, kind of the evolution behind that and, and where we are today. Okay. And um, can you also just walk us through the um, what happened at the onset of the pandemic and what uh, what what were your members talking about at the time and how did you help them sort of navigate um, through that situation? Right. Yeah. So I remember uh, back when Brian, back when the you know we we're we're getting news in. It was nineteen, early twenty. You know, there's this pandemic uh, or this virus starting in China, COVID-19 virus in China. You know, experts are saying eventually it's going to drift over here. So, you know, as, as citizens, we're all aware of that. From a professional standpoint, I remember the day when I got an email that came in from uh, another sister association, the one in Seattle, where they said, you know what, um, it's hit here. Amazon, Microsoft, the, you know, those are the, the huge key employers in, in downtown Seattle have basically said, we're sending employees home, we're shutting things down, 
and most of the other employers were then starting to follow suit in that regard. Um, and so that's when it, like, it hit me upside the head, like, oh my gosh, this is our future. This is gonna happen in every city. It's gonna happen in every state across our country. It's only a matter of time, it's not if, it's, it's, it's gonna happen. So um, we began to then have these conversations because what we needed and what our members needed is, you know, nobody has, um, you know, had to navigate through this kind of situation before uh, within commercial real estate, let alone, you know, larger society. So, you know, immediately there were a hundred questions, you know, how do we handle this? What do we do? How do we communicate with tenants? You know, how do we keep people safe? How do we keep things clean? You know, how do we protect, you know, what do we do? Essential workers, who are they? Since, you know, only essential workers could, could, could move around initially at point at, at, at the beginning of this. And so um, we were there to support the workers, get information, you know, hold, um, that's when we began to adopt uh, Zoom and, and communications like this mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And so hold meetings and communications and seminars and educate uh, as to what's going on to be able to drive uh, forward uh, support so the buildings could you know, learn and adapt uh, so that they could uh, continue to function, they could continue to support their tenants uh, in, in, uh, in a fashion that, that really makes sense, that was beneficial for them, but also beneficial for, for all those employers. And, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, Brian, when I was on one of your programs, but really, you know, the, the, the whole pandemic situation kind of has resulted in this, you know, what I, I refer to as this, uh, you know, great acceler acceleration of remote work. You know, I mean, at some point, it, work historians, if there's such a thing, or sociologists will look back 10 years, 15 years, at this period of time, or maybe it's longer, uh, but they'll look back and they'll say, yeah, here's, here's where we can actually mark and say over this period, there was a significant change in work behavior in terms of what's going on. Because prior to this, there was slow acceptance of remote work, okay? And we, we all remember there was kind of some uh, false starts to it. You know, Best Buy is the example everybody turns to. Yeah, they went to remote work and then they pulled people back. And so there were some that were adopting it a little bit, but, you know, there was hesitancy uh, for a fair amount. In fact, when you look at education, you know, that accelerated way past uh, the workplace in terms of adopting remote education. And that's been going on for a decade uh, strong. Um, universities are set up that are slow or, or solely uh, remote in nature, but the workplace <clears throat> wasn't um, as acceptant of remote work until the pandemic hit. And now, um, you know, that has acted, COVID has acted as this um, massive catalyst that forced the business community to say, okay, you know, let's reset. We've got to look at this because we're, we're now at the point where offices are still necessary. Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, still a critical part of our infrastructure today and will continue to be important. But with an increasing number of employees, uh, remote work will be either from a hybrid standpoint or fully remote standpoint will be an essential piece of how they view that, that work relationship. And it, and it really does make sense because we all embrace efficiency. I mean, in the office environment, businesses embrace efficiency, employees like efficiency, um, the markets, you know, they recognize efficiency and they'll reward efficiency, you know, in terms of stock value or whatever the case might be. And really, even if you look at um, science, okay, take evolution as the example, um, it's the organism that is able to um, be efficient in adapting to its changing environment that survives. So, so we all love efficiency and really, that's what I see the embracing of remote work, hybrid work is about. It's, it's all about efficiency. Think about employers, okay, just in general, over the last, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, traditionally, okay, um, and, and the labor market, all right, because they would um, open up a business or expand a business or, or plop down a, a factory or whatever, and, and the workers then had to commute or even move to a reasonable distance to be at that particular office or, or whatever a case might be. Um, and then more, more recently, 
uh, with labor markets tightening up, but still pre-pandemic, employers began to say, okay, where, where's the labor? We're going to locate this uh, facility, this office, whatever the case might be, near that labor market because you know we've kind of used up pretty much the labor where we're at and we want to expand so we have to go somewhere else today it's a different reality now now again there there's still a, a good chunk of business that that's still going to be that you know i'm at the office five days a week or i'm at the office three days a week but the calculus is changing all right so now the labor market is going to be much more efficient you don't have to worry about having to as much relocate that facility because you're going to be able to draw off a much, much broader labor market as an employer than you really have that opportunity pre-pandemic. So it really is just kind of mixing things up and changing the whole world, um, the, the employment world as we know it from both the employer perspective, but also the employee perspective. I know that's a long answer, but no, you covered a lot of ground there and raised some great points. And um, and I and I love uh, green buildings and lead certified buildings and all that. And but I've always thought it was kind of ironic that we're burning fossil fuels on our way to work in that lead certified office. So um, you know, there are a lot of different there are a lot of different layers to this. And so you, you raised some great points there. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your, um, you're going to be retiring in June. Um, mm -hmm. talk, us, talk, talk to us a little bit about that and um, what any plans you might have in retirement. Yeah, sure. You know, um, from, we all have a bucket list. And so there's probably a number of items that I want to take care of. I mean, I promised my wife this uh, trip to Italy. It, it was part of our 40th wedding anniversary celebration, and then the pandemic hit. And so we never got to go to Italy in 20. And so now we're going this fall. So I'm really looking forward to that. There's some other uh, vacationing we'll, we'll be doing um, that we have plans for. But beyond that, uh, you know, one thing that you could kind of call me is I'm an umbrophile. Um, and that's the term used for people who chase eclipses. Um, so I, I got started in this in, uh, in 2016 when there was discussion about, oh, in 17, there's going to be the, the big eclipse, a total eclipse going through the U.S. So my wife and I went out uh, and we, we, you know, an umber file is a person who maps out locations, weather, you know, just takes into account all kinds of factors so they get the best possible view of an eclipse. All right. A person who just happens to see it because they live in a certain area, you can't really call them an umber file whatever. So we, we said Wyoming, low probability of clouds in the sky, um, you know, no, good remote location. Let's go there. Uh, went to Wyoming, uh, saw it uh, near Casper, Wyoming, actually right through Casper. It went fabulous experience. Just for me, it was mind boggling to go through that, even though it was very short. And I tell people about it. Yeah, it's about two and a half minutes ago. Are you nuts? You know, and they said, yeah, but it's, it's something I, I like to do. And the, um, the piece that you don't hear about until you actually go through it, and, and you need to be, I think, a little bit higher ground. You don't have to be necessarily on top of a mountain, although that's where I was. We, we picked a mountain to be on. Um, is It's the actual um, experience of the, the, the shadow that goes over you, the umbria, okay, when, when, you, when you actually hit the very, very center, that you know, all of us know what it's like either early in the morning or very late in the day, the sun has set, but you can still see the brightness off to the west or the brightness off to the east, okay? The magic of the total solar eclipse, when you can be in the very, very center of, of it, that shadow, is that you get that sun setting in 360 degrees. So it makes you feel like I am not on earth. I am somewhere else. This is a different dimension. My senses have never seen something like this. It is just, like I said, mind boggling uh, to go through that. So I want to experience that again. So 24, um, there'll be a, um, another total eclipse uh, going through the U.S., um, starting in Texas and heading up uh, towards the Northeast. And so we're, we're going to experience that. But I'm going to practice in 23, there's something called an annular eclipse that's going through. So it's not a total eclipse. It's essentially where the moon blocks out almost all the sun, except there's this fiery ring that exists 
um, in an annual eclipse. So you got to make sure you, you know, you're, you got your eyes protected and all that, which mm -hmm. you should anyways with a total eclipse. Um, but, um, you know, that that's going to be in 23. That's going to be going through the southwest part of the U.S. And so we're going to check that out. So, you know, in terms of activities, um, I... I'm retiring, but I'm not going to be, you know, sitting on a rocking chair and, you know, sleeping all day. I'm going to still be incredibly active, involved in, you know, different projects. Um, you know, I'm really concerned about where the country has moved to in the last two years, four years, eight years. I mean, I was um, mortified by what happened on January 6th. And uh, this is uh, people that know me know that I am a purple person. OK, um, so this is not about being a Democrat or whatever the case might be, um, but this is about just the, the dialogue that is taking place in our country from both the left and the right is just so extreme that it becomes volatile. And, and I'm just I'm concerned about the, the long term health of our country and our Constitution. So I want to spend some time in that area, seeing uh, you know, how I might be able to help and assist uh, with, with conversations, uh, and, you know, leading us in a, in a better direction there. Um, I'm going to probably spend some time on the climate crisis doing something, uh, with that. Um, I've been involved with the national debt, uh, locally, uh, for a number of years, trying to educate people about that. Um, you know, as you can see by the flag behind me, I care a great deal about, uh, Ukraine. Um, I, uh, married into a Ukrainian family. My wife's Ukrainian mm -hmm. and, uh, her mother has a real interesting, um, history about her because when she was just an infant, she suffered under Stalin and uh, was mm -hmm. essentially um, malnourished um, as as an infant. And then, as a very young girl, saw the Nazis come pouring through in World War II and uh, experienced the horror of uh, seeing all the Jews rounded up in her little farming village shot, and then. Um, they were told, uh, everybody else was told, okay, grab, grab what you can carry, head towards this way, which was the closest uh, rail line. And they were loaded into cattle cars, brought back to Germany as forced labor. And if you survive that, then you had the choice of either going back to the Soviet Union, which they had no interest in being under Stalin, or coming to another country, and they came to the US. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a vivid history that I heard firsthand uh, from her. And uh, certainly understand now, you know, the, the pain and the suffering that uh, Ukrainians are feeling under Putin's war. So yeah. I, I've uh, anybody who knows me knows that I, I always have a virtual background uh, mm -hmm. going. And uh, uh, February 24th, when that invasion took place, mm -hmm. I said, I'm putting this one up and it's not coming down whenever I'm on a Zoom call mm -hmm. uh, until uh, Ukraine is free again. Well, good for you. And does your does your wife have family members there in Ukraine? And has she heard from them? Uh, hopefully, they're safe. And yeah, you know, um, she has like distant relatives, probably like fourth, um, you know, um, cousins, something like that. So she hasn't been in connection with them probably in the last um, ten years mm -hmm. since her mom passed away. Um, so I, I, she doesn't know the status of those individuals, uh, at this point, unfortunately, but, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's just something that, um, anybody who, who not, not just cares about Ukraine, but cares about freedom in this, in this world that, uh, we should all be focused on. Absolutely. And we're all horrified by what's happening there and hopefully, uh, it, it will, uh, end sooner rather than later, but, um, right. Thank you for sharing that, Joe. And it yeah. sounds like you certainly have a lot going on. And um, so best wishes to you in your retirement. And it was really nice chatting with you. So, um, All right. Well, Brian, hey, thanks for taking the time mm -hmm. uh, to uh, run this uh, discussion. And so you take care and you keep up the good work too. Thank you very much, Joe. Have a good day. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.